it occurs to me that most people fundamentally misunderstand Fire Lord Ozai as a character. I think they deliberately wrote him as a confusing character so that it wasn't necessarily clear the question that I'm about to ask. Was Fire Lord Ozai a bad dad? Now, at first glance, one might think this seems like a pretty straightforward, cut and dry question that one need not look any further than this. And then one could confidently say that this man, this chiseled, firebending daddy here, is a bad father, as he is literally trying to kill his own son. Most wouldn't disagree with you, but I'm not most people. This scene is far more complex than the surface level, but we'll get there. The premise. To answer this question, we must do two things. One, we must define what it means to be a father. And two, we must understand what it means to be a member of the Fire Nation. Well, the easiest topic first. What is a dad? Being a black man with no father figures to speak of, I had to turn to the internet to get a definition. And according to the differences between .org, the differences between a father and a dad is that as opposed to a father, which is the creature that gave you DNA and aided in the creation of your life, a dad is someone who participates in the growth and development of a child. A dad fulfills all the responsibilities associated with the role, personal as well as societal and cultural. The dad may or may not be the biological father. He may be the adoptive father, the stepfather, or just a nurturing male figure in the child's life. Being a dad means to participate in the child's growth and development. It means to provide them with the resources and ability to succeed in life and to give them the skills, qualities, and attributes that they will need in order to survive in their own society. So then, in order to determine if Ozai is a bad dad, we must let go of our ethnocentric interpretation of fatherdom and consider what it means to be the Father Lord. You mean the Fire Lord? That's what I just said. Hmm. Now, in order to gain an understanding of Ozai, I need you to do something for me. Forget about your life for a moment. Forget about the country, the year. You are now a person living in World War II era, Nazi Germany. For years, you've been taught the superiority of your nation. That to this point, the world has been conspiring against you and trying to put you down. To an extent, these extremists are right. Your nation is the most technologically advanced on the planet. And you are utterly unified as a nation. Meanwhile, the three other great nations are completely divided. One with northern snobs who look down upon the south. Another, a nation that's policing its own people and turning them in for thought crimes. While the last are just avoiding interaction altogether and live in complete isolation. If you lived on this planet where the world is divided and cultures are devouring themselves, meanwhile, your own culture is unified, albeit in hatred, is making enormous leaps in science, mathematics, and medicine, you could easily get swept up in the notion that your country is invading and taking control of the world for altruistic reasons, to bring peace, social quiet, and unity, even if somehow you don't get swept up in the sense of xenophobic superiority, you could fool yourself into believing that if your country controlled the world, things truly would be better. Here's something you have to understand. If you were in Nazi Germany, the statistical probability is overwhelming that you would have been yeah. a perpetrator. Yeah. Right? You think you would have rescued Anne Frank. It's like, think again. Those people are very, 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 very rare. They put their lives on the line to do that. They put their families' lives on the line to do that. You think you're one of those people? Really? It's like that. all that means is that you know nothing. You know nothing about yourself. You know nothing about people. You know nothing about politics or economics or history. It's a harsh lesson. You get the premise, right? If you were a person in Nazi Germany in World War II, believe it or not, you would have been a Nazi. Your morality would have been defined by your culture. And if you taught your children to dissent and rebel against the culture, you would be a bad parent. You would be actively harming your country. And beyond that, you'd be actively making your child immoral, as morality in most cases is defined by our society. This is more or less the literal representation of Avatar, The Last Airbender, and its world state. Though, in truth, the Fire Nation, in a literal sense, was intended to be representative of Imperial Japan, who, if you weren't aware, were allied with the Germans and committed genocide on the Chinese, the Koreans, the Indonesian, and the Filipinos. In fact, by some estimates, more Asians and Islanders were killed by Imperial Japan than any other group. But let's forget this real-world example and instead establish the world in which Ozai is set. History of the Fire Nation. In the years just prior to the reveal of Avatar Kyoshi, the Fire Nation had been experiencing a period of internal turmoil, as the great clans of the Fire Nation 
all vied for political power, undermining the power of the Fire Lord and of the Imperial Throne by shifting power to themselves. This led to the Fire Lord devising a plan to crush them and secure the throne from outside forces. He invited the newly revealed Avatar Kyoshi to the Fire Nation in an effort to quell some of the dissent from outsiders. However, at the time, there had been another Avatar candidate whom the sages of the Fire Nation had been using to claim power and to manipulate the masses. This false Avatar, after years of manipulation, had become disillusioned with the sages and of the politicians who had been using him for their own gain, and so had come to the Fire Nation to exact his revenge on the politicians and the Avatar herself. His attack leading to the death of a prominent Fire Nation Chancellor. Seizing this opportunity, the Fire Lord at the time put the blame of the Chancellor's death on the noble families that had taken sides and deposed them. In the time that followed, the Fire Nation began to utilize its unique access to steel and steam power to build the most powerful naval force on the planet, and as a result were called upon by the Four Kingdoms to battle the so-called Fifth Nation Pirates, a terroristic splinter cell that, as the name suggests, was composed of members from every major nation who had been terrorizing the seas for years. And so, with the pooling of power behind the Fire Lord and absent any political rivals, and his absolute domination of the seas, the Fire Nation experienced a period of unparalleled peace and prosperity. The culture that this instilled in the people and in the Fire Lord himself is that of might is right. For it was through newfound might that the Fire Lord eliminated the rivals that had destabilized their country and through might that the Fire Lord had brought peace and free trade to the seas. With the ready access of machinery, and with their superior ships, the Fire Nation was at the heart of commerce for all nations, and brought wealth and prosperity to its people. This sentiment of might is right was passed down from father to son in both the nation, and especially in the unnamed Fire Lord and father of Sozin. He famously taught his harsh lessons of the necessity of power to his children Sozin and Zessin. Sozin, obviously being a powerful bender, on par and slightly superior firebender to Avatar Roku, and Zessin, his daughter, being a non-bender, you can imagine the sort of one-sided beatings that Sozin was taught to dish out, though his sister did eventually learn the art of chi blocking, so surely the beatings probably became a bit less one-sided, though not much. As the decades passed, and absent Avatar Roku, Sozin quashed the last of his political rivals that had been warring amongst themselves in the Fire Nation, and with complete control over the country and its resources, Sources, Sozin was able to elevate the poorest of his people to status and wealth through occupation in his refineries, as they required a massive crew to build both the steel and the ships themselves. Though his resources became more and more scarce, Sozin turned his sights to the Earth Kingdom, and through these repeated political conflicts over resources, anti-Earth Kingdom sentiments became commonplace both organically through loss of jobs and likely through Fire Nation propagandized news sources. Sozin did make an effort to quash these tensions by creating colleges open to the four nations with a secondary result of allowing them to gain access to technological advances foreign to the Fire Nation. However, this led to the theft of technologies and priceless meteorite ore, which only increased anti-foreigner feelings amongst the commoners and the politicians, and again sparked a need to regain the people's approval, Sozin achieved this through dragon hunts. As again, the common sentiment amongst the people of the Fire Nation is that of might is right, and by proving themselves superior to the dragons, the nobles and elite generals could show their superiority and their power without the need to compete in Agni Kai, which already to this point were becoming increasingly common and increasingly brutal, as it was quickly becoming perceived as weakness to spare a person's life following a defeat. A side effect of these dragon hunts led to a rise in spirit attacks in the areas where they fell. As resources became more scarce, Sozin began claiming uninhabited islands in the seas between the nation, belonging in name alone to the Earth Kingdom and the Water Tribe, and none of the nations voiced their dissent openly. The Water Tribe couldn't get approval through its votes, and the Earth King only going so far as to send his warships on training exercises nearby in an attempt to goad Sozin into attacking his fleet and luring him into battle. Ultimately, it was truly a bloodless conquest. With the Earth Kingdom in decline and the rise of the Fire Nation's power, technology, and business, the Fire Nation's expansionism went completely unopposed. That is, until Avatar Roku caught word of the Fire Nation's quiet imperialism, the Avatar. To understand the series of events that transpire, you must know what the Avatar is. Assuming you didn't watch The Legend of Korra, skip to the timestamp on the screen. The Avatar is a living body of the Spirit of Light, and for all intents and purposes, the Avatar is the living body of God in this universe. They possess unparalleled might and unique access to and limited control over spirits. 
Through countless lifetimes, the Avatar's power only grows as each successor has access to all of the skills and prowess of the previous Avatar through the Avatar state, wherein either the Avatar yields their body over to another Avatar or to the spirit Rava itself. Having knowledge of the spirits and having lived amongst every nation and its leaders, the Avatar is given the unique power of intervention as a neutral party. They are turned to in times of conflict, when one side is exceedingly powerful or perceived to be out of line. This brings us then to Roku and Sozin. Having been best friends in their youth, Sozin likely never saw it coming, but the Avatar, his best friend and best man for his wedding, would stand against him. His conquest was peaceful, and merely a product of his might and his profound success in developing infrastructure. No one opposed him, and his conquest brought wealth and prosperity to his people and to all those who his people traded with. Now, this scene takes on a number of interpretations. For those who only watch the show and have no knowledge of the Fire Nation outside of their role, as the villains, it would seem fair that the Avatar would storm into the Fire Lord's throne room and squash the Empire because we have knowledge of what the Fire Nation is in the present, but we fail to see that this is the moment that pushed the Fire Nation over the edge, and in actuality, when you consider it from the point of view of the people, this is very closely akin to divine intervention. The living body of God is standing before you. What had used to be your best friend and best man kicked down your door and threatened you with death. You used to beat up on this guy in your training days and you even set him up with his wife who he was too scared to talk to. But he goes away for a few years and then suddenly returns and is threatening both you and your kingdom. You've brought peace to your country. You've unified the seas and have created technologies that are sought the world over. You've even created schools to teach the people of other nations the methods of creating these machines and are single-handedly taking the world into the Industrial Revolution. And now you're being threatened with death if you don't stop. He tells you that you're upsetting the balance and that the four nations are meant to be just that. Four. Kinda racist when you think about it, right? When you think about it this way, the fire blast is pretty justified. But then, this god pins you to the ceiling and blows up your palace without regard for the people in it. You are left humiliated in a pile of rubble. You, the most powerful person in the nation, all your life you have been taught that might is right, and your life has been overwhelmingly successful based on that principle. Yet, here you see that the boy you once knew is gone, and now a living god has taken his place, and you have no hope of defeating him. And because you were taught might is right, you must concede. You accept the terms he gave you in an act of mercy. You must stop your spread of wealth, of knowledge to the world, because to do otherwise means your death. Also, as a side note, I just want to mention Sozin most likely had to have his people build like a ladder or scaffolding. So he was up there for hours, quite possibly a full day just molding in his shame for being inferior and utterly powerless by comparison to the Avatar. Anyways, might is right and no longer is Sozin at the top. This is the reality that he faced. This singular act of violence perpetrated by the Avatar is in all likelihood what led to the extermination of the Air Nomads, of the assault of the Southern and Northern Water Tribes, and of the occupation of the Earth Kingdom. Sozin was so outclassed, he, a king, the most powerful bender in the world, was made a fool of. If he, the leader of the most powerful nation on Earth, could not stop the Avatar, no one could. It is here that his plan begins, to end the Avatar cycle. Because if you really consider his actions, it's what he did. Sozin allowed Roku to die on that volcano, and then attempted to kill the Air Nation Avatar before the Avatar could gain its nigh-unstoppable power by utilizing the Comet. Likely, because Sozin considered the possibility that even an unrealized Avatar could solo the Fire Nation unironically. Even if the Avatar never took part in the battle, had the Fire Nation invaded the Air Nomads on any other day with a geographic disadvantage in that the Airbenders having the high ground and buildings atop mountains over the ravines, the Fire Nation would have certainly lost the invasion. They couldn't roll in their tanks. Their lack of air mobility meant that even the slightest attack, even from a novice airbender, would have sent them cascading down the side of a mountain. It was only really possible to succeed in this invasion on the day of the comet. 
And even if the Fire Nation didn't seize the opportunity to win the fight in a single day, the Avatar would strike back with a vengeance and no one would be able to stop them. As we see with Aang wiping out an entire Fire Nation fleet at the North Pole before even mastering waterbending, a 12-year-old child Avatar is demonstrated to be by far the most powerful entity on the planet, easily exceeding the combined might of the world's militaries. To be clear, Sozin's fear of a full-powered Avatar led him to his plans on the day of the comet, because when you shoot at the king, you can't miss. Following the extermination of the Air Nomads, we see that Sozin isn't actually interested in genocide. The reason the Air Nomads were treated this way in the first place is because of their power and the inability of the Fire Nation to ever hope of controlling them, let alone capturing them, as we see Aang escapes an entire naval platoon on his own while bound. The support for this being that as Sozin set his sights on the Water Tribes and the Earth Kingdom respectively, as we see in the episode with the Puppet Master, and again in this episode with Lee in prison, that at this point in the war, the Fire Nation is not committing open extermination. Sozin instead singled out the Benders, capturing and imprisoning them in a place where they could not get access to other elemental masters. For all amongst them knew, might was right, and everyone in the four corners of the world knew that the Avatar stood above all. This fear and hatred of the Avatar was passed down for generations, over 100 years, from Sozin's generation to that of Iroh and Ozai. We get this information in the Legacy of the Fire Nation extended lore as it mentions the cruelty and immensely difficult training that Sozin put his son Fire Lord Aslan through to make him the most powerful Benger on the planet. This, of course, out of sheer respect for the Avatar's power and upon understanding that his own efforts to kill or capture the Avatar would be in vain. Sozin, of all people, would know exactly how strong he would need to make his son to have a hope of standing a chance against the Avatar. Having lost to one once before and having seen the Avatar battle a violently erupting volcano on his own whilst in the Avatar state, he could easily compare his son Aslan's power output to that which he knew the Avatar could achieve. And in Iroh and Oza's generation, this continual push for outward displays of power were a requirement. We know this is the case as Iroh sought to demonstrate his supreme firebending through the defeating of a dragon, and Ozai through countless Agni Kai. Furthermore, the culture of the Fire Nation was single-minded in its support of the conquest of the other nations, as Iroh is referred to as the esteemed Dragon of the West, a war hero in a war that was largely predicated on the extermination and the imprisonment of other benders. And it's hard to be a war hero in a war of extermination without the support of the people. And amongst those people, his own younger brother, Ozai, would be around the age of 12 when he began hearing word of the power and might of his older brother, the Dragon of the West. This ideation of his brother's might and of their long-standing history and competition likely being the reason Ozai himself sought power through Agni Kai as Iroh had laid claim to killing the last firebending master. No one would ever be granted the rank of dragon again. Ozai was forced to prove himself in other ways. He even went on his own failed search to capture or kill the Avatar, as we see in Legacy of the Fire Nation, page 13. Ozai would later become disillusioned with his brother's might, and by extension, his right to rule after Iroh crumpled and lost his will to fight upon the death of his son Luten. But it wasn't just Ozai, but rather the people of their nation were divided on whether or not Iroh should be ridiculed for allowing his emotions to kill his aspirations for greatness. Section 8 Countering the Culture The people of the Fire Nation had gone through over 200 years of indoctrination of might is right. Many of them are fully on board with world conquest, thinking that if they beat a people in combat, then there is nothing wrong with killing them. This isn't just implied, but it's even shown on screen, as we see with the children and teachers in the Fire Nation not batting an eye at the idea that the entire Air Nation was wiped off the planet via open conflict. It is only when Aang suggests that the Air Nomads weren't warriors, that this combat was not upfront and honorable, that anyone in the series expresses discontent at the fact that they were exterminated. And, to an extent, the Fire Nation is correct. Every single member of the Air Nation was a bender. This because of their deep spiritualism and connection to the spirit world. Meaning every single member of the Air Nation could have been the Avatar. 
and could and would on the day of the invasion been fighting back. But further, the culture of the nation is apparent in the way that they are trained. I have mentioned the way that Sozin and Aslan were stated to have been trained in the extended content, but we also see this in the series for the characters we're discussing, Ozai. So let's look into how Ozai interacted with his children given the context of this world. Training. Now, many would look to the manner in which Azula and Zuko were trained, and there clearly was a favoritism for Azula, as we see when they presented themselves to Ozai. And obviously, Fire Lord Ozai would openly ridicule Zuko for his lack of skills when he was a child. However, this fact in and of itself means that Ozai was participating in Zuko's training, if not as an instructor, simply as an observer. However, if you consider the way that others in the nation train weakness out of their children, this could have been worse. Zuko and Azula were never expressly forced to fight each other in the way that previous Fire Lords had made customary, and it's not that far off comparatively. Sozin was an extremely powerful firebender, and his sister was not a bender at all, and yet they were forced to fight. But at least she had chi blocking to level the field. Zuko, on the other hand, could barely stand on his own and would be horribly marred if he'd ever been forced to fight Azula on the regular, as she's a psychopath with little regard for others. B. The cruelty. The cruel words that Ozai had for his son could easily be interpreted to be well-meaning truths. When Zuko defended a teacher who was weak-willed and had allowed Azula to bully him, Ozai lost his temper and told Zuko that his sister was born lucky while he was lucky to be born. This statement, however, means more than what Zuko had believed. It doesn't mean that Zuko has no value. It means that he is going to have to earn everything in his life. He was not born with innate power, skill, or might. He would have to make himself that way if he wishes to survive. Because as we know, the culture dictates that might is right in the Fire Nation. And as the firstborn son of the Fire Lord, Zuko would inevitably lay claim to his birthright. And one day, Azula would claim that right through might. She could challenge Zuko to Agni Kai and simply take the throne. A second interesting note is that Zuko at this point had no firebending prowess to speak of. He was inept, yet he was willing to argue with his sister on the same topic which she had just assaulted a firebending master over, meaning that Zuko failed to understand his place here. Azula was stronger than her teacher, and is stronger than Zuko. So he, by a culture that they existed in, had no right to speak here. A mistake that will rear its head again in a few years in the war room. Zuko could not physically stop his sister from imposing her will, and neither could this teacher. So as the weaker people, it was not their place to speak out. As such, it was important that Zuko gain power. We see over the two years following his mother's banishment that Zuko does just that. Off screen, he works hard and even gains a substantial amount of his father's approval. And this is where we get to perhaps the most defining moment in both Zuko and Ozai's relationship, Agni Kai. Zuko in the war room speaks out against a plan to sacrifice hundreds of soldiers as a distraction while the Fire Nation mounted a more powerful attack from the rear. Zuko is not the first person to speak out against this plan, but he is the most vocal in his choice of words and by far the least respected and weakest person in the room. And in this action, he disrespected the general whose idea he challenged and his father who commanded the audience of the generals. In this culture of power, the only way to resolve this act of disrespect is Agni Kai. As we hear Zuko's crewmates finish Iroh's sentence, we can infer this is the common practice for resolving instances of disrespect. Zuko, in a display of arrogance, accepted that he was disrespectful and refused to rescind his position, instead accepting the Agni Kai, which he thought was against the older general. However, as we know, having spoken out of turn in his father's war room, it was his father that must handle the matter, lest he defer to a lesser man, the general. And Agni Kai can only end when one opponent burns the other. And with Zuko groveling for forgiveness and unwilling to fight for his beliefs, this fight could only end one way. However, this too is an act of mercy from Ozai. Whether Zuko was confident in his ability to beat the old man in a duel or not, the general was in all likelihood a fire-bending master and powerful in his own right, or he would not have his position. Zuko, with three years more training when we are introduced to him in the series, was barely able to scrape a win out over a middle-aged admiral. If left to fight the general, 
the bout could and likely would have ended in Zuko's death, as at this point in time, sparing someone's life in an Agni Kai was considered a sign of weakness, and in all probability, killing a crowned prince of the Fire Nation in a duel would be a point of pride and reverence for anyone involved. Whereas, instead, Ozai ended the bout in a single blow and did not kill his son pointlessly. D. Banishment. This is yet another point of contention and people misunderstanding Ozai. They often think that Zuko was banished for speaking out of turn. It's understandable as most of us saw the show as children, and Zuko himself says this out loud in season 3. However, both Iroh and Ozai present this situation differently. Iroh, it was hard for you when you believed your mother was gone, and I saw you struggle with your own firebending abilities, as slowly but surely your younger sister's bending skills surpassed your own. There may have been a time when the Agni Kai was a useful tool to settle disagreements between ancient firebenders, but in our world, I find it difficult to see as anything but a brutal and barbaric tradition. The Agni Kai tore you from your father, your nation, finally your own sister. It's easy to say that these wounds were tragic, but in my estimation, they were your passage into manhood, setting you on the path to become the good man and great leader I know you to be. That's Iroh. But ultimately, Zuko was banished for his refusal to fight. In a nation where a person can literally take the throne by winning a duel, Zuko displayed such a profound weakness in front of all the nobles, and by extension, the most powerful firebenders in the nation. And in so doing, he had damaged both his own reputation and the reputation of the throne. And as we've seen in the past, if the person who sits the throne is weak, the nobles will seize power for themselves. This is not me projecting on the show. Ozai says it himself. Zuko's weakness was shameful, and he must learn through suffering. He proclaimed this, and the only way Zuko could return and truly expect to claim his birthright is through a display of power in capturing or killing the elusive avatar. Logically, it makes sense on a few fronts why this was Zuko's punishment. Zuko could not duel nobles to gain respect like Ozai had done before him and risk further tarnishing the throne. And, to Ozai's knowledge, there were no dragons left to conquer. Instead, the last great power in the world was his target, the Avatar. Some people take this to be a fool's errand that his father sent him on, as Admiral Zhao says. However, there was no evidence that the Avatar cycle had ended or that he'd been reincarnated. Any logical person would then assume that the Avatar was a 100-year-old airbender who likely never found any masters. As the Water Tribe was robbed of their masters, and the Earth Kingdom has sealed its doors to the world. This meant that Ozai sent his son on a mission to capture or kill a 100-year-old master airbender with limited access to Avatar powers. Certainly, this was no small task he asked of him. However, with the prestige of an Avatar under his belt, who in the kingdom would ever question Zuko's might? Whether this took him a decade or two mattered not as Ozai would rule until his death. But of course Zuko did the unthinkable and found him in three years. And it's not until Iroh revealed himself to be a traitor to the Fire Nation that Ozai changed his mind in allowing Zuko to chase the Avatar himself. The chase. Another moment people point to to suggest that Ozai had no intention of repatriating his son is when Ozai seemingly goes back on his word following the events at the North Pole. However, when you consider the world state, Ozai's position makes more sense than simply trying to keep his son from coming home, even if that's how you or Zuko interpreted this act. The reason being, Ozai cannot risk the Avatar falling into Iroh's hands as he has shown that his loyalty to the throne is less than that of his loyalty to the spirits. As he just found out, a youthful avatar who has made his way to a waterbending master, and now with the potential of gaining access to a firebending master of Iroh's caliber, is an inconceivable threat. There can be no more mistakes. The avatar must fall before he gains another master as he is simply too great a threat already. Allowing Zuko to pursue the Avatar alone would be the greatest blunder possible. And given that Iroh is a traitor to the nation who has spent more than three years teaching Zuko, the safest assumption is that Zuko has turned as well. Bringing both Zuko and Iroh into custody would be the only logical choice to make. Accepting his son. 
We can clearly see that Zuko was never truly resented by his father, at least in the sense that he did not like his son. Merely, he didn't like the behaviors he was exhibiting. Ozai wanted Zuko to be powerful, cunning, and understanding of his status in the world. Upon his alleged defeating of the Avatar, Ozai welcomed Zuko with open arms. He even hosted a rally to present his son to the people as a war hero who slayed the Avatar. No longer the boy who couldn't even stand up to his own father, he was now a man that had slayed a god. He openly tells Zuko of his pride in him, for his power, for his cunning, and most of all, for his loyalty. Iroh, his uncle and master, had betrayed the Fire Nation, and yet somehow Zuko had gone against his feelings of loyalty for the man who was always kind to him and did what he considered to be the right thing, what is best for his people and for his nation. Whether Ozai had doubts or not is irrelevant, though there is much to suggest he didn't, considering his surprise on the day of Black Sun. Ozai had presented Zuko to the nation. Any failings of Zuko would be perceived as Ozai failing as a leader. So the act of presenting him to the nation is demonstrative of his confidence in Zuko and his right to return as the crowned prince. The Day of Black Sun. On the Day of Black Sun is the most damning event in terms of Ozai's failed parenthood. The infamous and epic lightning redirection scene. Now, upon first glance, one could come to believe that Ozai is cruel and manipulative of Zuko, but that's far too superficial. Upon Zuko's entrance, we see that Ozai is anticipating bad news from his son, news that Zuko might otherwise have been afraid to deliver if not for the eclipse. Yet he dismisses his guards to make Zuko more at ease, or if he chooses to believe, for privacy. Either way, Zuko explains that Azula lied about which one of them had killed the Avatar, and Ozai doesn't immediately jump to anger. Instead, he leans in and seeks to understand. Logically, he might have sincerely believed that Azula had lied in order to allow her brother to come home in some dramatic turn of character or some act of kindness. Zuko had battled Team Avatar for a year and was integral in their final confrontation in Ba Sing Se. It would make sense that a normal sister would be willing to share the glory that she had not done the work for. Why would she take credit for an essay that she simply put a period on? And again, Ozai was not angry to this point. He seems to think that his son is coming clean about not earning his return home. Guilt over his failure and Azula's success. Something most fathers would be proud of. Integrity. It isn't until Zuko confirms Ozai's worst fears that he becomes enraged. Ozai doesn't call his guards. He doesn't overtly threaten his son. He effectively tells him to go to his room. He says, I'm so angry, I can't look at you. If you stay, my anger will overtake my judgment. Leave now. This is pretty reasonable. The last time the Avatar had come to the Fire Nation, he had quite famously walked into the throne room and dispatched the Fire Lord with no effort whatsoever. And Zuko, his son, who had been at his right hand for months, had neglected to tell him that this living god with a vendetta was walking his way over as they speak. His rage here is well-deserved. Now, when Ozai does make a threat, it's only when Zuko is being what most fathers would consider blatantly disrespectful. Ozai had effectively ordered Zuko to go to his room, and he refused like a child who had just broken dishes and then stands there threatening to do it again. Ozai takes a step forward to make a show of force, and instead Zuko makes his own show of force, drawing his swords and commanding his father for the first time in his life. Now, I think Ozai was proud in this moment. We see his entire demeanor change. The animators make a show of Ozai's face relaxing from rage to a more mildly annoyed face, and his frown even becoming less pronounced. In the next moments, we get an explanation of Zuko's interpretation of his childhood, of his father who never gave him love in a way that was understandable. But in this scene, we see that Ozai really did mean for Zuko to learn something from the hardship. He said it all those years ago, and he says it here again. Suffering would be his teacher. And the fact that Zuko thinks he was banished for speaking out of turn, rather than for his refusal to fight for his beliefs, and at the end of it all still thinks it was wrong for his father to show Zuko his place in the world. All of which spoke volumes to Ozai regarding his son's disposition and his understanding. As we see, Ozai clearly disagrees and says that Zuko Zuko didn't learn the lesson he was meant to have. Clearly, the lesson is that of power and of respect, of becoming a man of the Fire Nation. Surely it was a harsh lesson, 
effectively stating, don't disrespect someone you can't impose your will on. And if you disagree with me in this interpretation of the exile being a lesson to make Zuko a more worthy man, just know that Iroh thinks the same thing. He thinks what happened to Zuko could be viewed as a tragic act of brutality, but it both was intended to make him a man and did in fact do exactly that thing. Zuko, as a 13-year-old boy in a war room, was bold in that moment and arrogant until the moment the duel started. But in actuality, it was just that, arrogance and bluff. He did not have the power to back up his words. Now, obviously, there was no way for him to ever hope of beating his father in a duel, but that was not the point. It was to show Zuko his arrogance and overconfidence in a meeting could and would result in Agni Kai, given the culture of the nation, that if he was ever to assume the throne and he were to be challenged in the exact same way, what must be expected of him? And he failed to understand this. He failed to realize the ramifications of his weakness and of his lack of respect. Had he dueled the general and had the general General made a claim or a wager on the duel would likely have ended in the prince's defeat and embarrassment twice over. First, as the general, who in all probability is a master firebender, defeated Zuko and burned him. And second, when the general made his wager on the Agni Kai, had the general say made the wager that Zuko abdicate his throne or say he must marry the general's daughter, then Zuko and Ozai by extension could and would have easily lost control of the throne as the man would now be a general in the army and his grandchildren heirs to the throne or even worse for Zuko at least, he could have died as it's considered a sign of weakness and shame culturally to spare someone's life in an Agni Kai. Ozai's burning of Zuko was an act of mercy and his banishment was a means of teaching him to strike out in the world and impose your will on it and if you are weak it will consume you now when zuko tells ozai that he was a bad father he laughs at the idea meaning that he found the notion laughable he had passed on the traits that he knew zuko needed he even mocks the idea that iroh could be a better father than him what fatherly traits could he inherit but the ways of tea and failure there was not a trait he thought iroh could pass on that would make someone successful meaning ozai thinks the opposite of himself he really and truly believed he was a good father and while he wasn't necessarily kind he had had done what he needed to make his son a man. Now, here in this scene where Ozai's rage flares up again, we see Zuko decide to walk away from the situation. Zuko is a master swordsman. He is in a position of power, and he thinks that his father needs to be dethroned. So why not save both of them the trouble and do it already? Why let the Avatar dethrone him when Zuko is right here and capable? While this could be interpreted as Ozai baiting Zuko into a fight that Zuko could lose, this interpretation is not at all likely. On the contrary, it's more likely that Zuko would sweep through the royal guard and Ozai both. He had demonstrated the skill to fight off a garrison of firebenders without firebending himself, and the capacity to defeat a platoon of earthbenders and their captain again without firebending at all. Ozai did not oppose Zuko when he commanded him to sit. He did not call for his guards to defend him or capture Zuko when he made his intentions clear. I think there are only two things this can mean. One, and this is the most likely, that he sincerely wanted nothing more than for his son to become a worthy successor to the throne, a character of unshaken will and power who would fight to the death for his beliefs, even if that meant killing the people he loved, even his own father. And two, that he thought he could stall Zuko long enough for his bending to return and kill him. Now, both of these are plausible. However, in this scene, we get very little to suggest this is his intention. He doesn't call for his guards. He doesn't make any aggressive advances to provoke a fight. And it's only when Zuko is leaving the room and proving his fears of Zuko's weakness true that he pulls out the psychological trump card to force Zuko's hand and fight his mother. But even his attempts to bait Zuko into staying point further to my position. Ozai tells Zuko a story of him and his mother plotting to kill his father, Fire Lord Azulon, to gain the throne. Symbolically, and literally telling his own son that if he wants something with all his heart, he needs to be willing to kill for it. Just as he had done. But likely, to Ozai's disappointment, it doesn't cause Zuko to rage at the idea that his father had hidden his mother away from him for years. Instead, he cries and does nothing, sparking a rage in Ozai. And we see what many may consider the nail in the coffin of Ozai's fatherdom, his attempt on Zuko's life. Now, to many, this action is irredeemable. 
There is no circumstance in which they could justify the attempted murder of a child, let alone their own. But tell me this, if your child was a school shooter, would you put them down? What if they just told you they were planning an act of terrorism to join ISIS? That they already had a mission planned against your country. Would you let your child leave to bring death and despair to the other people you love? I sincerely hope that you wouldn't. Because this is a situation that Ozai was faced with here. His son was abandoning his nation and joining a known terrorist to the Fire Nation, the Avatar. Even unrealized is a threat that could end the most powerful armies in the world. And the only thing left keeping Aang from being a nigh unstoppable god that he literally is was his lack of a firebending master to teach him. The Avatar had stopped the march of progress a hundred years before and had set in motion the heinous act of the Air Nation genocide out of the fear of the Avatar returning. The Avatar was so powerful that the royal family had physically abused their children for generations to draw out their latent potential just to hope to stand a chance against him. The Avatar was a threat so great that the Fire Nation had turned to selective breeding to stop him as Ozai himself was the product of deliberate breeding of Roku's children and Fire Lord Azulon's. Yet, here was his own son saying that all this suffering and progress was for nothing, and that at the end of the day, he was going to help the Avatar take control of the world. Ozai was simply doing what he felt he must to defend his nation, his people, and when you really consider it, the world at large. The Avatar is an all-powerful entity with no oversight, capable of crushing the world's nations, of literally ripping continents apart. In a world where bows and arrows are still meaningful weapons in warfare, the Avatar is a nuclear warhead. The Verdict I think it would be foolish to say that Ozai was a great father. To my own culture's standards, he neglected his son's emotional needs, he physically harmed him, and forever marred his identity both literally and metaphorically. That said, Ozai was not objectively a bad dad. He taught his son lessons that he would need in order to find success in a world in which he was born. A society defined by one's physical power and the respect they could command. Zuko was born weak and could not achieve much success through coddling. As we see, he makes no progress in the presence of his mother. It was only through his suffering that he was made strong and that he gained the courage and power to stand up for himself and the things he believed in. We see that when Zuko had falsely accepted credit for killing the Avatar, his father perceived this as Zuko having achieved an understanding of power and the pain of isolation caused by his powerlessness. He thought Zuko had learned his lesson. For now, in his father's eyes, his son was strong enough to slay an avatar and so loyal to his people that he was willing to capture the man he loved most and turn him in for treason, which in most circumstances is a death sentence. This Zuko, who Ozai thought had come home, could be considered a great man in the Fire Nation. Powerful, loyal, respectful, and above all else, willing to make the hard choices. This Zuko Ozai believed had come home had all the attributes of a great leader and was treated as such, but it was all a farce. Ozai really and truly believed he'd gotten through to his son and taught him a lesson. The years of scouring the globe as an outcast without the support of his nation, without the overt love and care of his father or mother, Zuko at last comprehended the lessons Ozai was teaching him. Might is right, and if you want something, you have to be willing to fight for it. As we see with Zuko's confrontation of Ozai and his decision to, quote, take out Azula, Ozai really did foster an environment that would make his son into the man he needed to be. Of course, he was hoping Zuko would be the next Fire Lord, leading the nation of ultranationalists, but we can't judge Ozai for the morality of his nation. The things he did were not looked down upon by his society, but held up as the standard. And as such, it would be difficult to say he is definitively a bad dad. As a husband, the worst. Fire Lord, pretty mid. But was he a bad dad? I can say definitively, he was not. If anything, he was a good one. But what do you think? I'm sure some of you disagree. If so, comment below. I'm interested in your position and your reasoning. But for now, that's all I've got. My name is Tendo, and I am out of here. Fuck, my voice is gone. Peace. Peace.